Hello, I'm Kwame Anthony Appiah and I teach philosophy at New York University. And this talk is about some pros and cons of the moral theory that's called utilitarianism. It's a completely natural thought, I think, that morality answers the question, what should I do? And a plausible answer is that you should do what's good and avoid what's bad. The more good and the less bad, the better. So that leads to this view. Consider your options and assess for each of them how much more good than bad it will cause. That's the value of the act. Then pick the option that has the highest value. Any view that this takes this sort of approach is consequentialist. It judges acts by the value of their consequences. And it's a maximizing view as well. It says that we should aim for the best consequences, the maximum value. If you want to be a maximizing consequentialist, you need some way of calculating the value of your options. In the early 19th century, the founders of utilitarianism, uh, Jeremy Bentham and his friend James Mill, thought that the value of an action was determined by how much happiness it produced, and they sometimes called this utility, hence the name of the doctrine. They thought that utility was increased by pleasurable experiences and decreased by painful ones. So utilitarianism was uh, maximizing consequentialism about utility. Utilitarianism focuses on the effects of our acts on the experiences of other creatures. Since animals can experience pleasure and pain, their utility mattered too. Bentham was an animal welfare advocate long before this was common. So, for example, if I slander you, this will only impact your utility if hearing about it pains you, or the slander leads others to treat you in ways that cause pleasure or pain. So let's give this point a name. Utilitarianism is concerned with subjective well-being. I must consider the combination of pleasure and pain each creature will experience if I perform each possible action. I can tell whether the combination of pleasure and pain produced by one action is better than the combination produced by another because, for example, I can offer Mary one choice, doing painful back-breaking work on our farm for a hundred pounds, and another, in which she gets fifty pounds doing the farm's accounts, and then see which option she chooses. However, Mary may care about more than the pleasure and pain she will experience. Perhaps she thinks physical labour is honourable work, producing food for the community, while the accounting task is trivial. If it were just about pain and pleasure, she would do the accounting, but she thinks the farm work more important. So this suggests that the right measure of utility isn't amounts of pleasure and pain exactly, but rather which option the person would prefer. So option A has more utility for someone than option B, if all things considered they prefer A to be. This is what we'll call preference utilitarianism. Notice that the value of an option depends on the utility it produces, not on who is getting it. Utilitarianism is impartial. It argues that what you should do depends only on the results for others and not, for example, on your relationships with, to them. And so if two people face the same options, they should make the same choices. Utilitarianism is also what's called agent neutral, that is, What's important is objectively important, so it can't matter to different degrees to different people. Now, if you're considering the consequences of your various options, you won't usually be certain about what will happen when you act. The results of your acts will often depend on things that haven't yet been decided, including what other people will do. And some consequences of your acts are very long term, and we can't predict a lot about the far future. Uh, so what to do? Well, utilitarians think that while we don't know what all the results of our acts will be, we can always consider how probable various outcomes are. As a result, they think we should be guided by what's called the expected utility of our actions. To calculate the expected utility of an act, consider all the possible outcomes and multiply the utility of each outcome by its probability. Then you add up all those products and the result is the act's expected utility. So here's a simple case. You have two options, visiting your friend in the hospital today or not doing so. 
You don't know whether she's well enough to enjoy a visit from you, but you reckon that, that the probability for each outcome is about a half. So the total utility to you, and to her, of your visit, if she is well enough, will be 50 units, 25 units each, because you're friends who enjoy each other's company. If she's not up to it, the total will be 20, 15 to you, you'd be happier if she were better, and 5 to her, because she's not enjoying it very much. So the value of the visit is 50 multiplied by 0 0.5 plus 20 multiplied by 0 0.5, which comes to 35 units. Now, of course, if these numbers are right, then if you go and she is well enough, the result will be 50 units, and if you go and she isn't, the results will be 20. But since you don't know which, this gives you a way of valuing an option without knowing what will happen. So, I've been considering utilitarianism so far as the view that you should do what will have the best consequences for utility. That's act utilitarianism. But you could respond in a different way to the difficulty of working out the consequences of each particular act. You could propose instead that we should assess not acts, but rules for acting, and that's called uh, rule utilitarianism. I may have, in general, no idea what the overall utility consequences of lying on a particular occasion will be, but I'm pretty sure that adopting the rule, lie whenever it suits you, will undermine the value of spoken communication. It may be easier, then, to defend a rule in the light of our general knowledge about human life than to establish the expected utility of a particular action. Here, then, are the features of utilitarianism that we've discovered so far. It's a view about actions. It's consequentialist. It's a maximizing view. What it aims to maximize is a form of subjective well-being. And it's also impartial, requiring each of us to treat everyone the same, counting all as equal, and agent-neutral. If we're faced with the same choice between options, what I should do is the same as what you should do. And finally, item six on our list, it deals with our limited knowledge by telling us to be guided by expected utility, in the case of act utilitarianism, or by adopting rule utilitarianism. Now, I began by saying one can naturally be led to utilitarianism by thinking about the general point of morality. But further reflection raises doubts about each of these six claims. Naturally, utilitarians have responses, otherwise they wouldn't still be utilitarians, and I'll suggest some of them. The main burden of this talk, though, is to introduce you to some objections because they reveal important features of the way many of us actually think about morality. So let me consider each of these features of utilitarianism. It's surely right that morality is action-guiding, but is it just action-guiding? Decent people surely don't just do the right thing, they do it for the right reason. What commends generosity is not just that it makes the beneficiary better off, but that it expresses the goodwill of the donor. Someone who doesn't understand that fails to understand morality's demands. What matters morally isn't just what we do, but our motivation for doing it. Furthermore, even when we aren't actively doing anything at all, it can matter how we respond emotionally. Your indignation at the cruelty of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 is a moral response. You can send money for refugees or call your MP to ask for more military supplies for Ukraine or more sanctions on Russian leaders, but your indignation is part of your moral response, even though it isn't an act. So there's more to being a good person than good deeds. Now, act utilitarians may argue that developing these sorts of feelings will make us more likely to do the right thing. If so, we may have act utilitarian reasons to take the option of developing these responses. And rule utilitarians too can say that their view commends the development of dispositions to the sorts of feelings that will do this, lead us to generosity and indignation, uh, for the same reasons. But these arguments involve having a rather odd attitude to your own feelings. We should think of them as fitting, not because the responses are the right responses, but because responding in this way has good effects. And that seems to require a sort of alienated attitude to our own feelings, viewing them, as it were, from the outside. A second sort of argument against utilitarianism is an argument against consequentialism. <laughs> 
The word consequentialism was actually coined by uh, the English philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe in the 1950s to criticize the view that in acting we should consider only the consequences of our acts. She gives as an example of what consequentialism gets wrong the idea that you might murder someone if that would have the best overall consequences. But, Anscombe said, of course the strictness of the prohibition has as its point that you are not to be tempted by fear or hope of consequences. The fact that Sally Surgeon could save the lives of five patients awaiting transplants doesn't give her the right to murder Robert Random to harvest his organs. The more general point here is that consequentialism abandons one central feature of our moral thought. We think some things like murder are wrong even if they have excellent consequences. So too, there are acts that are right, again, without regard to consequences. If I made you a promise and I'm in a position to keep it, I do wrong if I don't. I owe you at the least an apology. In serious enough cases of broken promises, I must do more than apologize to make it up to you. That doesn't mean there are no excuses for promise breaking, but it does mean that it's not a sufficient excuse to say that doing so had overall better consequences. We can call views that take right and wrong and notions of obligation to be central to morality deontological views. So any argument for deontological views is an argument against consequentialism, since consequentialism is the view that we must consider only the consequences of our acts. A deontologist need not deny that consequences matter. She argues merely that they are not all that matters. Yet a third line of objection to utilitarianism is that it places impossible demands on our thinking. Consider what utilitarianism requires. Find all your options, consider the possible effects of each option on every sentient being, assign each possible effect a probability, multiply this by the value of that effect, sum the results for each option, and then identify the option with the highest total value, and do that. But isn't that basically impossible, even in the simplest case? Identifying all the options is already incredibly hard. Try cataloguing all the things you could be doing right now. And even if it were true that the best thing to do would be to do the thing that had the highest expected utility, getting from that view of value to practical advice about how to act now looks impossibly hard. There is in any case a general feature of our moral thinking that runs against maximizing. It's the fact that there's a difference, we think, between what we ought to do and what it would be best to do. Some acts go above and beyond the call of duty, and the technical word for that is that they are supererogatory. Usually we think that our duty is not to do the best thing. What people deserve from us is not the best we can get for them, but enough for a decent human life, for example. Helping someone get more than that, once we've given everyone what we owe them, is great, but it's not required. Utilitarianism, though, says it's what we ought to be doing, what we must do. Sufficientarianism is the view that we should aim for everyone to have enough for a decent life, not that we should aim to secure them the best lives possible. If sufficientarianism is right, and if more generally there are supererogatory acts, the maximizing aspect of utilitarianism is a mistake. Here's a fourth challenge. Utilitarianism focuses on the effects of our actions on the experiences of other creatures. But if that were all that mattered, the best world would be a utopian version of the Matrix, in which everybody's plugged into a machine that erases the memory of their life outside and feeds them a fake life of beautiful experiences. Maybe some people would accept this deal, but many philosophers think they would be making a mistake. And there are simple cases that make this focus on how things seem look wrong. If all that matters is subjective experience, it doesn't matter if your spouse is unfaithful as long as you never find out. But who wants a spouse that thinks like that? And speaking of spouses, in considering what we owe morally to our families, there's a line of argument against both the impartiality and the agent neutrality of utilitarianism. For surely treating my spouse better than yours, partiality to my own family, far from being incompatible with morality, is required by it. Value, when you're looking at consequences, looks like it's not agent-neutral, but agent-relative. 
I've already mentioned some difficulties for the way utilitarians respond to the epistemic challenges mentioned in the sixth feature of utilitarianism, but I've left one large challenge until last. It seems very unlikely that there are ways of measuring value that could serve the functions that utilitarianism needs it to, because even if I can rank all the effects on you in terms of their value, identifying them then with what you prefer, there doesn't seem to be any good measure of value that allows for effective comparisons between individuals. Take the choice I mentioned earlier between backbreaking work for £100 versus less painful work for £50. Now suppose the choice I have to make isn't which to offer you, but how to divide the tasks between two people with different psychologies. I can't rank these options by asking which each prefers. Maybe they both prefer the same one. So I'm forced to ask which brings more utility. But I've no idea how to look into two minds and make that comparison. Now there are proposals out there as to how to do that, but this, and discussing them would pretty quickly get very technical. But the standard ways of measuring preferences only allow you to make comparisons of options for a single person, and so they make interpersonal comparisons of utility impossible. I suggested that utilitarianism was something you could get to by a natural line of thought. But once you make explicit all that it requires, it doesn't look so natural. Action isn't the only thing that matters, nor are consequences. We're sufficientarian. We believe in supererogation, so we don't think everything is about maximizing. We think that what's go really going on matters, as well as what we believe is going on, so we care about more than subjective well-being. We approve of partiality and agent relativity, and we deal with the limitations on our knowledge in contexts where calculating expected utility looks impossible. Finally, it's hard to come up with a measure of utility that allows plausibly for interpersonal comparisons. So even though there is a natural line of thought I began with that leads to utilitarianism, there are many problems once you try to implement this idea. Of course, lots of lines of defense have been offered to defend the spirit of utilitarianism. As often in philosophy, things turn out to be more complicated than they first appear. Mm -hmm.